The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about foraging behavior, and then that will be followed by some things on anti-predator behavior. And those will be the last topics before the midterm. We will finish anti-predator behavior next Friday, but we it should leave time, because we'll start that on Wednesday, we should have time uh, for some reviewing since the exam is on Monday, the Monday, not next Monday, but the following Monday. Okay, now this, this first question you should be able to answer it out by now because it's come up before. Does the level of foraging or hunting depend on the amount of hunger? Is it independent of hunger? And the reason I raise the question again is because in the reading by Scott, uh, he paints a somewhat different picture than the one we learned about from Conrad Lawrence and Lehausen's work with cats and John Flynn's work with, the, with cat brain stimulation. So what's the simple answer? Is it dependent on hunger or not? In fact, in some of the videos I show, occasionally you will hear mention this, they, people just assume that if they're not hungry, they won't hunt, and they, well, you'll see, we're going to see a video next week, well, you'll get an example of that that contradicts some of the ethological studies that we know about. So, God doesn't make it clear that some innate foraging drives are separate from hunger, but Remember, we discussed uh, this before, but Scott does introduce one more thing to this. He, uh, on page 120, he talks about role of social cues and of learning. So my question here is, why might an animal eat more when feeding with a group of, of his conspecifics uh, than it would if it was feeding alone. In fact, sometimes a, a monkey group, if he, he'll he finish feeding alone, but then if there's suddenly he's with a group, you know, he will start eating more if they're all eating. So why, what do you think is behind that? Why would that evolve? And when you think, when I ask you a question like that, why it would evolve, what I want you to think about is what is the benefit for the individual? What's the selfish reason why an animal would do that? I mean, right, he, he ate to satiation. He shouldn't be hungry. So why would he now start eating? Did you read it? Because God does suggest the reason. In the reading. If all the other animals, there's a limited amount of food there. And if they're all eating it, there's not going to be anything left. And animals need to maximize their food intake to survive, so he's, an animal will eat more in a social group for just that selfish reason. Eat it before it's all gone. And that's why we think that tendency evolved. It's also sometimes just called social, social facilitation uh, by social psychologists. But here in animal behavior, you can call it social uh, facilitation, but there is a specific reason why that should evolve as innate behavior. 
Let's go to the next topic here on conditioned taste aversion. It's also called the poison bait effect. And Scott calls it a form of classical conditioning. And uh, in fact, he has a, a, there's a box in the book there on page 122 where he goes through that. And he, it was discovered by John Garcia in California. Uh, it has properties that do not fit the descriptions of classical conditioning, and this is why. For one thing, it's something the animal learns in one trial. And almost all, there are examples of other one trial learning, like a rat stepping down from a platform onto an electrified grid, he will learn in one trial not to step down. But most things takes longer to learn, at least with positive reinforcement, that's true. In this case, it's, it's not only just one trial learning, but this so-called unconditioned response where the animal gets sick and feels nauseated as a result of eating, a lot of times that sickness doesn't occur immediately. It takes a little while, and yet they still learn to avoid that food. And the third thing is that the memory is much more long-lasting than you find in classical conditioning. Okay, Humans that have experienced this, and many of us have, it can last for years. For example, I, when I was a kid, uh, I was probably on the verge of getting the stomach flu, but didn't know it, but we were having a, we were roasting marshmallows. And I was, I got, often we not only brown them, we burn them a little bit, and I ate a partially burnt marshmallow, got sick afterwards, or felt terribly sick, and I couldn't stand the sight of that kind of marshmallow for 20 years. A very clear poison bait effect. It didn't matter whether the illness was really caused by the marshmallow, because other people didn't get sick from it. I think I was getting sick anyway. How many people here have experienced that kind of effect in their lives? About a third of you. Does anybody want to tell us? <laughs> Give us an example. They might like to hear it. <laughs> Come on, one of you, t tell us what you experienced. Me? Yeah, um, Go, anybody. Um, well, like this, I don't know, with me, it's like, I don't know, it just makes me feel sick. So, I mean, like, I don't know. What did you eat? Like, it was, it was, I don't want to describe it, it was kind of gross. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> I was stupid in the salt, though. <laughs> It was like ground up meat, and it has like fillers in it, and I don't know, I just decided it really grossed me out. I felt nauseated. You felt nauseated afterwards, and that's mainly the, the what causes the effect. And so you, how did it affect you later? I just didn't eat like hot dogs or things like that. You wouldn't eat anything like it, right? For how long? Or is it still there? Um, I got over it, I think. Well, this happened to me when I was about, I would say, seven years old, and uh, I was certainly probably 30 years old before I could eat a marshmallow like that. All right, so it's not really, what is it then if it's not classical conditioning? Uh, Scott has written that conditioned taste aversion is, of course, a form of classical conditioning. Why would he say that? The reason is, first of all, many learning theorists, theorists have lumped all learning into just a few categories. And many textbooks on learning are they're organized that way. The few major sections, classical conditioning, instrumental conditioning, and now they usually have a few other types too. And also, many people, including many scientists, have believed, as you know, from the class before, that almost every behavior is learned, especially here in America. 
what Lawrence calls this form of learning an innate disposition for learning. The innate school marm. It shows us evidence for a built-in program for a particular kind of learning that it's very easy to understand why that would be adaptive. You know, if you want, it's been used to control predation of livestock. If you are having sheep being killed by wolves, for example, by it, usually it has to be a particular wolf pack, so they're all going to eat some. You, you give them a, taint, a sheep that's been a lamb or something that's been tainted, okay, or calves or, you know, the kind of thing that they're eating. And uh, they well avoid it for quite some time. It's ver somewhat variable in how effective this is, but of course, it, it, just how many animals actually eat it and get sick from it will vary too. Now, that's, it's related to another form of avoiding food we call neophobia. Animals tend to avoid new things. So you, you set up trap for a mouse or a rat in your house. Uh, if it's not something really familiar to the animal, they will be very, very cautious. You know, it needs to be something that they really love and has a strong odor. Certain kinds of cheese have that effect. And, uh, sorry. Well, I hope, I hope that will wait. Okay, so you, why would they avoid something novel? Well, it's not as likely to be safe. You know, they know what's safe. They've had experience with it. How would you expect that effect to vary with those two factors, hunger level and age? Would it be greater or less in a young rat or an old rat? You might say, well, an inexperienced rat, he's more likely to eat anything. But in fact, it's the reverse. The young, you should know with humans, uh, when you were younger, you were probably much more likely to avoid a lot of things. And your parents are always trying to get you to try new things, right? And you say, I don't like it. Uh, my uh, youngest daughter would say, I don't like that stuff. She's never had it in her life. I knew that because she'd come here from China. So she had never had many of the American foods we were having. But her mother, much older, of course, would try it and like it and so forth. But, you know, as the daughter grows older, she gradually will try more and more things. But if you make them, as I pointed out before, if they're hungry enough, neophobia decreases. And again, of course, that's adaptive because they don't, an animal doesn't want to starve to death. So they have an, these are innate preferences, though, that we're talking about, okay? And then Scott discusses another situation of social facilitation, in this case in capuchin monkeys, faced with a novel food. They discovered that the monkey was much more likely to eat that novel food in, if other monkeys were eating near him. And it didn't even have to be the same food, which was the surprising part of the study. It would be understandable if you saw other animals eating it. It was the same thing. Oh, that's got to be safe, you know. They're eating it. It's not going to hurt me. Uh, but they'll do it. Even they'll, They're more likely to eat the novel food even if the monkeys are eating something more familiar. And I, I can't really explain that in terms of adaptive behavior. Okay, let's talk about another social effect on uh, foraging. The the ospreys, a, a, a bird that uh, forages for fish, 
in the ocean. Uh, how can they benefit from hunting, uh, that is fishing, success of neighbors, even though they don't share? The, the osprey that brings a fish back to their communal colony uh, doesn't share it with the others. And yet it will affect the others. Because the, and this, there, you, there are some data put in the chapter there, Scott's chapter, he presents some data that animals, the frequency that they fly off in the same direction greatly increases if a osprey has brought back certain kinds of fish, but not all kinds of fish. Why does it depend on the kind of fish? Can you think, you know, even if you've not read it, you should be able to think of some reason why it might have evolved that way. Because fish differ in how likely they are to be swimming in schools. If the fish aren't schooling fish, like the alewife, for example, in the oceans out here, if they tend to be schooling fish, uh, but flounders are not in schools. So if the, if the osprey comes back with a flounder, the other birds will ignore it. You know, that they'll just consider that bird a lucky bird, but it's not going to affect them. Because, but if it was a, one of these birds, uh, they, he doesn't mention herring, but herring are another schooling fish. You know, if so if it was a fish like that, then he's much more likely to fly off in that direction because he knows there's got to be a school of, school of them out there or this bird wouldn't have come back with a fish. So that gives them some benefit for living in a colony. So it serves, serves as a kind of center of information transfer. They've looked for the same thing with black-headed gulls, which also uh, nest... Near, uh, near each other, and yet they don't respond that way. Even if the, a black-headed gull is coming back from a pile of food, so there's a lot of it available, the others won't fly off in that direction. So the question is, why are they different? You know, I have in my, I have in the margin of this book, which I've had for several years. Uh, you know, black-headed gulls are stupid in comparison to ospreys. But in fact, there is a reason why they might have evolved that way. Uh, at least earlier in their evolution, they probably fed mainly on food that was scattered. Okay, so not likely to be found. So they'd be wasting energy if they constantly flew off in the direction uh, that an animal had come from just because he had food, just because of different feeding preferences, at least in for a long period in their evolution. So they've evolved different, differently from the ospreys. Okay, group foraging. I want two good reasons why foraging in a group of herbivores may be better for an animal like a bird than foraging alone. And I can give you a hint. Pay attention to birds right now. You ever look at birds outside, you will notice something happening as the fall goes on. Food is still fairly plentiful, but it becomes less and less as the winter approaches. And when snow is on the ground, it becomes much harder to find. So what, what change do you see in birds? Birds that you normally never see in groups, in flocks, start flocking. It looks like they're all just flocking because they're, oh, they're going to fly south together. But in fact, in many cases, that's not the reason. You'll see sparrows doing this. You'll see, you know, juncos doing this. They, they all stay around here all winter. So why would they do that? What are the benefits? First of all, protection from predators. Because when there's a lot more eyes, you know, the predators have finding less food, too. So they're going to be hunting these uh, hawks, the red-tailed hawks around here, certainly catch, they catch pigeons, they prefer those because they're bigger and fatter, but they will, they'll catch songbirds too. Uh, so the predator is more likely to be detected if there's a lot more eyes that could see them. And also, if they're in a group and there's a red-tailed hawk attacking, 
they're only one in a group, so the chances that they'll be the one the hawk selects are, are reduced. That's a kind of dilution effect that protects animals in a group. Well, in addition, we mentioned the, uh, oh, I should, the second one, of course, is they're more likely to detect food sources for the same reason that they're more likely to detect a predator. It's very interesting watching a large group of birds are doing this. All it takes is one seeing the food, and he flies off separate from the others. Almost always the entire group almost immediately is with him and flies down. And, of course, social facilitation does increase their food consumption in addition. This is just an example of group foraging. Here's pelicans foraging in groups. The groups, they tend to be uh, a little smaller. Here's the American white pelican, one foraging group. Uh, does the same reasoning apply to carnivores in their hunting behavior? Well, some of the same reasons apply. They have increased likelihood of finding prey. They have increased likelihood of catching them because of cooperative hunting strategies. And these are examples I can think of. Uh, all these animals have been studied and their hunting behavior has been studied. We know that lions, or at least lionesses, hunt in groups. Wolves certainly do, uh, though the groups vary a lot in size. The wild dogs, the African wild dogs, always hunt in groups. Uh, you find some of that in hyenas as well. Uh, and then in the sea mammals, the killer whales, the orcas, hunt that way. Uh, and even humpback whales engage in uh, cooperation in their catching of prey, like they trap herring fish. One of them goes below and emits a string of bubbles, and the bubbles rise up and form a kind of cylinder around the herring up above. And the uh, herring, of course, could swim right through that, but they don't. They avoid the bubbles, so they they sort of trap them in there. And the 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 humpback whales up above then can feed on herring. So it's a cooperative hunting strategy. They obviously have to take turns being the one that creates the bubbles because they're getting much less food. This is just examples. There you see a bunch of uh, um, female lions, the lionesses, and there you see below their... Uh, a group attack on a on a buffalo, and they would have very little chance of bringing that buffalo down if just one of them were doing it. It would take at least two, and the more there are, the more likely they are to bring it down. Uh, <laughs> I put this in just so I can point out that just because they're in a group, they will not always attack. I mean, what is the likelihood that even three lionesses could bring down that rhinoceros. For one thing, the rhinoceros can run pretty fast, and the other is the likelihood that he would gore at least one of them and maybe all of them are very high, and they can't afford the severe injury. You know, they don't, they don't have lioness doctors, you know. So they will simply watch animals like this. They have to make the decision. You know, is it worth it? What's the cost? If they're super hungry, yes, they will attack even animals like this. Here's a group of wolves. Uh, one wolf can never bring down a buffalo. You know, the buffalo's too big and strong. He can kick very hard with those hooves, but with multiple wolves... And they often precede this by running, chasing the animal for a long distance. So they tire him out, and that makes him less able to fight them off when they finally attack him. So it does take a, a wolf pack like this. This is a fairly large pack uh, to bring a buffalo down. And here's the African wild dogs. You see how relatively small they are compared to that zebra. But again, and dog, these dogs are well known for singling out the weaker ones and then 
chasing them for very long distance. They have great stamina, and they take turns being the ones closest to the, the zebra, So, and which takes a little more energy. So they take turns doing that until finally they exhaust the animal, and then in spite of their small size, they can... Uh, they can kill an animal like this. You can see the zebra there. He will kick out at them if they get too close to him. And the dogs are patient. They just run him down until he doesn't have the energy to do this. And there's since two, the year 2000, there's a number of things you can find in, on the web using Google Scholar, and find including a number of theoretical models about group. Uh, hunting and group foraging. Uh, one article uh, is about raven scavenging, which favors group foraging by wolves. Why would that be true? This is the article. And uh, here's what they're talking about. If a wolf pack, if there's only two, and sometimes three in the wolf pack, uh, they're very, very likely to be closely related. So they're helping each other. They're helping the genetic fitness of their siblings, usually, or their parents. But the larger wolf packs often include unrelated individuals, okay? And yet, they will still join unrelated individuals, well-joined wolf packs, and they'll be accepted. So why would that be? What would the benefit be? Because in fact, you find that on average, they're going to be able to hunt better and eat more food if they're not in such a large pack. Because after all, when they bring down prey, the whole pack has to eat. And they found a reason. They Studying these wolves, they found out that if, let's say, there's only two and they bring down food, uh, they it takes a long time to eat large prey, and they lose a lot of the of the meat to scavengers like ravens. But if they're a larger group, they lose a lot less. There's a lot more wolves to pay attention to the scavengers and drive them off. And they modeled it, making assumptions drawn from their studies, and, and they were able to show that this, this works. There is a good reason why they would do this, uh, just because of the raven scavenging. So it just points out factors that you wouldn't think of ordinarily. Uh, but, in fact, the computer models uh, show that it's very likely to be true. Uh, here was another computer model, but it's relevant to something I'm going to bring up a little later. So, uh, if you're interested in the modeling, uh, this is a good one on what we call the ideal redistribution. How do animals distribute themselves when they're, they're foraging in groups, but groups can go to different feeding areas? Some of those feeding areas are very rich. Some of them are not so rich, you know. And yet they distribute themselves in an, in an optimal way. It's called the ideal free distribution if you solve it theoretically where they should be. So we'll be talking about that. Uh, in this one, I, I mentioned this briefly. This was uh, a model dealing with this kind of problem. When they're foraging in a large group, they don't actually have a clear leader. They do not lead, need a clear leader to be able to function well, like if they detect food. Only one or two birds has to detect the food, and yet all of the food, it will very rapidly be communicated to all of them, okay? because of the types of cues they need to respond to. They, similar things are true of migrating birds, okay? There often is a leader, but the leader is often temporary. It can change, uh, and they keep flying in a concerted way, you know, uh, even without a clear leader. And yet they behave in a coordinated way. 
If they turn, the whole group turns and so forth. So this is about that issue. And it's been dealt with also in simulation work. Okay, what do we mean by the term optimal foraging? What should a foraging animal be optimizing? What's, give me a quantitative expression. He should be optimizing the amount of food taken in, the net amount of food. That is net, no, that's not fair. Net energy, which is from the food he's eating, but that has costs too. They're using energy to get it. So the net energy intake per unit time, that's what they should be optimizing, okay? A foraging animal should optimize energy intake minus cost. And that leads to these kinds of questions. Why should a feeding animal move to another patch of food? If he's at a rich patch, yet we often observe they move to other patches too. Why do they do that? How long should a dive last if he's a diving animal? For a diving bird or a, or a sea mammal? What determines that? Why do they evolve the kind of behavior they've evolved? I picked these examples from the book uh, to discuss a little bit. The first question is crabs. Why do crabs choose to feed on intermediate-sized mussels instead of the bigger, more meaty, larger mussels? They generally ignore the smallest ones, but they also will ignore the largest ones and pick the intermediate-sized ones. And if they deplete those, then they'll feed on the smaller ones. Why don't they feed on those big meaty ones? Because they're so hard to open. It takes so much energy. Okay? So it's a very simple matter of, remember, energy intake minus costs. So you have to take the costs into account if you're going to explain the foraging of that, of these uh, animals. Here we're talking about crabs. If we deal with marine iguana, uh, we note that the large ones feed, like this one, they feed subtidally. That is, at high tide, they will be out in the deeper water uh, catching food. Here's a whole group of them. Now, the smaller ones, in fact, generally don't do that. In fact, you can, if you keep track of their size, you can put them in three groups. You know, the big ones like this, you know, the intermediate ones and the small ones. The small ones all feed at low tide in the shallow water. None of them feed subtidally. In the intermediate, only in the intermediate size, you will see some of them feeding in both situations. So what is the reason? Very simple. The they lose body heat. Remember, these are reptiles, and they lose body heat, when, and it's colder there in the deeper water at high tide. So uh, that is a cost, because they have to make up for it. They have to eat rapidly enough that they can, by afternoon, when the sun is out, and they can sit on the rocks and heat their bodies up again. And if they have, they're smaller, they have to, and they're not catching the food as well, especially because they're slowed down because they're getting cold, you know, they might not warm up in time. So it's much more efficient for them to feed in the less productive shallow water. Okay. Let's talk about now the foraging birds again. Forage, in this case, dealing with the red shank. Um, I'm asking here why they why do they visit less productive patches in addition to their focus on the most productive areas for finding the large worms that they feed on in the ocean bottom. And the reason they do it apparently is to get information about food availability. They they seem to be they find a need to know what's the relative density of food in all the nearby feeding areas. And also they need to know how many birds are there at each one. Because no matter how rich it is, if there's already a huge number of birds there, you know, the amount one animal is going to get is going to be reduced. 
Okay, these are red shanks. There's one showing him by himself. You see the kind of shallow water that they look for those worms in. Uh, here he's poking below the, the water to pull out a worm. Here's a group of them, and they normally forage in groups like this. So we talk about the ideal free distribution in a, in a description of foraging by groups of animals. So what do we mean by that? An animal will tend to go to a less rich food patch if joining a group of animals at a richer patch would reduce the amount of food per animal there to a point below what it could get at the less rich patch. You say, well, how could he possibly know that? They do. And they do it by the sampling method that I'm talking about. They're collecting information. All, all of them, none of them will stay at that rich patch all the time. They're always flying away a certain percentage of their time sampling the other areas. So they know what the average is for that area. So they've evolved. So they distribute themselves in an optimal way to avoid excessive competition. And this guy, Charnoff, developed the ideal way they could do it if they had all the information. And then to make it more practical, uh, he modified it. Uh, so they know now that an animal seems to sample food sources in a region enough to know the average density of the available food items. And it changes its foraging location when food density drops down to or below the average density of the area. But there is an additional factor that I'm, I'm, needs to be brought up, and that is the dominant animals often will exclude the subordinates in the rich patches. So the animals that, the, that are more likely to be at a less rich patch of food early on, even though there's still a lot of worms left at the rich patch, are the less dominant animals. Just the, they're each, each optimizing their feeding success because they have to take into account how much time they're going to be allowed to forage by those dominant animals. Okay, and this is from Scott, a figure Scott uh, publishes where there's two patches of food. Uh, the profitability is on the ordinate, so you see one patch is a lot more profitable than others. But how profitable it is depends on the numbers. You can see if there's between one and five animals. You can see if there's five, it's it's becoming less profitable. And when it drops down to the point that is labeled X there, then it's just as profitable for him to be in the other less rich path at the point labeled Y there. Okay? And that, of course, depends on numbers of animals there, too. Uh, and that would affect the shape of these curves. But that basically is why animals will move. They collect enough information to be able to judge profitability of each of those areas. And they also seem quite aware of the number of animals at each place that feeding. They know the rate that the food is being depleted. So what do they do if there's a predator near? You can't, just because there are predators around, there's often predators around, you can't stop eating. So when you study that, study the conflict they have, uh, it's been studied quantitatively in these uh, two types of gobies, the sand gobies and black gobies. Uh, it's observed that feeding decreases, as you would expect if a predator is detected nearby because they have to spend more of their time avoiding that predator or hiding from him. Uh, but that effect is less if the animals are hungrier. In other words, they will be more risky in their behavior if they're very hungry. But it's also less if they're better camouflaged. And the, the sand gobies are better camouflaged than the black gobies, so they were less affected by the presence of a predator. They have an innate difference. You know, it's like, it's as if they knew that they're camouflaged and they're going to be harder for the, the predator to see. So I wondered, I'm asking the question here is, is this ideal free distribution relevant to population control at all? The answer 
appears to be no, because the models anyway of it don't attempt to extend overall population control, but only the small foraging groups. It would be too much of an extrapolation to extend it to an entire population. Uh, that has been studied scientifically, and we know that overcrowding has been studied extensively in rats, but there are some studies in other species as well. We know that fertility goes down. Uh, they end up with impaired immune systems, so you get more illness, more infections. They, became more, they become more irritable. They fight more. Uh, if you look at their adrenal glands, you see that they're secreting a lot more adrenaline. They have larger adrenals. And you also see in these groups really sudden population declines, not just because they're being caught by predators, but because of these other factors. And this has been observed for many small mammals that tend to be to reproduce very, very rapidly, and they reach, uh, they tend to move towards an area that's maximal for what the environment at that time can support. Uh, but if they become overpopulated, you get population crashes. It's very well known for some small mammals. You probably know about the lemmings, that when they become overcrowded and Scandinavia, they, you end up with, they migrate in large numbers and sometimes they seem to get confused in their navigation and they, they will swim out to sea when they, normally they're just swimming across the fjords to get to another area where there might be fewer lemmings, but sometimes they just swim out to, to sea as if they're committing suicide, but it appears to be a navigational problem and it could be because of malfunctioning, uh, nervous systems. Okay, I don't want to discuss mur murder right now. <laughs> we can do that later. We talk about sociobiology. Uh, but what we'll do is I want to get started talking a little bit about anti-predator behavior, which is the next topic, because I have, there's a couple of nice videos I want to show, uh, uh, especially one about animals escaping from predators, so you can see that for a number of predator-prey relationships. Uh, Scott starts out talking about anti-predator behavior in his Chapter 7 by distinguishing between primary and secondary defense strategies of prey animals. And these are defined like this. Primary strategy simply decreases the probability of being attacked. So if he's camouflaged or if he has good hiding strategies, then the probability he'll be attacked is reduced. He times his foraging. A hamster comes out only when the shadows are long in the twilight period. So he doesn't come out when he's easier to see. And he comes out when there's still some light, but the shadows are long. It's easier for him to hide. Animals are active at night or day for similar reasons. And then you have group foraging. Again, that decreases the probability that any one animal will be attacked. And then, of course, you have warning calls. Sometimes they're responding to warning calls of another species. Secondary strategies are when an attack does occur, they need ways to get away from it. And fleeing as rapidly as possible and dodging the predator chasing them is extremely important. And you will see in the video I'll show uh, next time how successful that can be. It tires out the predator, uh, greatly increases the chance of getting away. Uh, having very high endurance is important if they can they have to be able to outrun a predator and keep running without tiring so the more endurance they have the better some of them will just have the, a play dead strategy the opossum is well known for that but there are other animals that do that also you know, why would they do that well because if they act like they're dead and they're totally still it's doesn't evoke 
predation behavior as much. The predator is likely to lose interest. Or he might just say, well, I can come back to this one. It's dead anyway. You know? So we will see some of that. Okay. What is countershading? And I'm asking another question there. Besides what it is, why would cephalopods need a countershading reflex? Okay. Well, Here's an example of powder shading. There's actually two birds here. How many do you see? You see this one because he's got counter shading that's opposite to what it would be normally. It's a model. Normally birds are lighter on the underside, darker on the upper side because when you're above a bird, and you're, let's say you're an eagle, you're hunting for small birds flying down below. If those birds are dark on top, you're less likely to see them because the ground is generally a lot darker than the sky above. So they tend to be, but if the prey, if the bird of prey is below and he looks up, he's less likely to notice birds if they're light on the underside. So with reverse counter shading, it makes this bird stand out. But the other one that's in there is camouflaged. Uh, and so it's very hard to make out exactly where it is, at least in the black-white photo. So these are, um, a year or two ago, Jenny Wu was in the class, and she pulled these off the web. Um, by the time I got to the topic, is she was already doing the reading, and she found these. Very nice illustrations. Uh, if the, the animals in these pictures don't move, they're h very hard to see. And I point out what's there. You know, it's not that easy to tell that that's the body of a spider right there. Here, the crab is sort of easy to see, but if you're just glancing around and the, there's a lot of unevenness in the gravel bottom of the water, it's very hard to to see that crab. And here again, if you're glancing around, you, you don't notice that frog there that easily. And here, the dragonfly, only if I, it's only because I tell you there's a dragonfly there that you, you will probably make out, oh yeah, there's some legs there, and there's a head there. And uh, here's some other examples. There's a bird in this picture, a <laughs> leaf warbler. Well camouflaged, he looks just like the leaves. Um, here the jaguar, a predator, is pretty well camouflaged, hard for prey animals to see him when he's still. That's why a, a predator will spend quite a bit of time, you know, still. And when he does move, he moves rapidly to a new place and waits again. And here, there's a caterpillar on that leaf. Almost impossible to see. But that's the outline of the caterpillar there. Uh, if you don't know he's there, I don't think you'd notice it at all in the picture. Just like here, the grasshopper taken in Colorado. Uh, very hard to see. If you look very carefully, you'll see that there's an eye right there. I think. <laughs> okay. That's camouflage. So we'll start the class next time about predators who, because predators develop search images. They have an image of the prey they're looking for. And octopus and squid have developed an incredible ability to counter that ability by changing their appearance. And so we'll start uh, with this next time. Thank you.